Welcome back to Interior Analysis. I am your host for this episode, Jelani T. Kelly. I'm Evan Westman. I'm David Jones. And today we will be discussing the summer blockbuster, I don't know if you can call it that, action comedy Bullet Train, released August 5th of 2022 in the U.S., directed by David Leitch. Leitch? 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 One of them. Yeah, it's one of them. I said, I think I said one of them correct. One of them's correct. Screenplay by Zach uh, Okowicz. And based on the book, I didn't know it was based on a book until I looked it up, by uh, Kotaro uh, Asaka. So, let's, 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 we're going to start off with some initial reactions from y'all. Neither of you had, this is my second time seeing it for this uh, episode. Uh, I believe neither of you have seen it before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I only watched it just the one time about a week ago. So, give me, go on. Do you want to go first? All right, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so I, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, it's this was mid for me. It kind of got me by the end. X three was definitely the best part, but I did not enjoy the ride of this as much as it wanted me <laughs> to. Nice. Yeah, the ride. I know. <laughs> I was trying to think of a way that wouldn't sound like a pun, but I was like, whatever, I'll go with it. It feels like a lower tier Guy Ritchie movie mostly i heard someone describe this uh one of my favorite analysts alex Cairos, called this like a movie that feels like it came out in 2003 or like would have come out in 2003 i'm not quite sure what he means by that but it i think it maybe guy ritchie is like the feeling that i'm guy ritchie and tarantino a little bit i felt the tarantino a little bit yeah but not like all it only certain elements of Tarantino. Yeah. If I had to, if I had to guess, like which director influenced them more, I mean Tarantino is more famous, but it felt more like Guy Ritchie to me. Tangerine and Lemon's dynamic was the best aspect. Um, I kind of wish they were the protagonists, actually. Yeah. Or at least they got more focus. Major gripe: nobody should use "I Need a Hero" at all, especially in their climax post Shrek Two. There's some songs that have been used too iconically, like. No movie should ever use bell bottoms again post Baby Driver. You, you just can't do any better than that did, so don't even try. So, on the whole, I, I'm going to try to not bash this too much because I think I'm just the wrong kind of audience member. Yeah. I'm just on the wrong wavelength. I don't think it's actively bad. I'm just, just I'm kind of mid on it. That said, for better or worse, I'm probably going to spend most of this episode comparing it to movies well, not just movies, but, like, a, a other things that I think do what it does more effectively. That's the end of mine. All right, good. I don't need to hear any more negativity from you. Uh, David? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, my favorite moments of this were, like, probably, I would say, the middle. I think maybe it's the middle. It was mainly the tangerine and lemon dynamic. It was whenever they gave, like their subplot they were like the most shine that's when i was most engaged i enjoyed like the comedy that came with a world-class assassin who always makes like if not because of him something always bad happens and he has to kind of figure it out and he doesn't want to like cause harm i found that like charming and then i found like i found myself wishing like i had watched this in the summer in the movie theaters when it came out because it seems like one of those movies that like you just walk into like you're out it's like saturday and it's hot in july and you're with your friends and you're like you want to go into the movies because it's hot and let's escape the ac and then you just watch like a star-studded cast and just like nonsense happen for two hours and you eat popcorn and you don't think about it too much that's what this movie was for me and i feel like if i had it in that environment i would have enjoyed it more but like at home on netflix i was like hmm what else yeah, it feels like a movie to not watch by yourself, mm. um, and I did watch it by myself, so well, that might have... Friends. That's on you. I prefer to watch stuff for this by myself so I can focus on it more. I think there's a, there's a very specific type of thing that, like, I feel like is perfect. Like, I, I watched Cocaine Bear a couple weeks ago with some friends, and that would have sucked if I had watched it by myself, but because I was watching it with friends, it was, like, kind of a good time. It's not a good movie, though. <laughs> so this is the greatest movie ever? 
Okay, sorry, Godfather. <laughs> yeah, Evan's on the wrong wavelength. Uh, Scott Pilgrim is your type of movie, and this is mine. And that's mm -hmm. okay, uh, except you should like this movie. This was originally rec recommended to me by Hassan several times. But once my brother recommended it, I'm, I'm pretty sure I watched it the same night, I, I think. My mom <laughs> wanted to recommend it too, because she watched... When... I think it was when my brother first flew out to San Diego... They watched it out there, and that's when she saw it. She wanted to recommend it too, but forgot, and then let me know she wanted to recommend it by the time I'd already watched it. I, I want to blame the marketing for this movie as to why pe not as many people saw it as I think they should have. That's the reason why I didn't see it in the theaters. It's the only reason, the only thing I remember seeing from it was like the trailer showing the unfunniest parts of the movie. That's Hassan's quote, because... He said the marketing for this movie is trash. And I agree. And the trailer made me never want to see it. I was just like, this looks unbelievably corny. I'm glad I went into it blind because the surprise cameos, I think, added another layer to the movie for me and kind of coincides with my topic. And in my opinion, obviously my opinion, because y'all are in the mid middle, this movie is a movie with a lot of star power that does work. Uh, I remember us discussing this phenomenon at one point. I think David hit us with the hard truth that these movies end up working really well or flopping. I don't know the box office, what it made. Um, I got it. Worldwide gross is $240 million, just about, on an $85 million budget. So not so, awful. Yeah, not too bad, especially for an R-rated movie. Like, yeah. Those have a harder time. It could have made more with better marketing. I agree. Because the trailer was not good. No. It made its money back at least, and more. So, that's good. But yeah, that's all, that's all I have for my initial reactions. We're ready to just, just jump into the topics. My topic was ensemble adding to unpredictability. Y'all both already know by this point, and people who have listened to several episodes already know. This is my thing. Uh, when something can surprise me pl pleasantly, I normally end up liking it more. I want to say this love for the unpredictable started back when I was reading Injustice, the DC Elseworld comic book story where Superman claps the Joker, um, because it wasn't, and because it wasn't main canon, anything and everything could happen. It also doesn't help me when watching movies, well, we're all screenwriters, and Crawford warned me, I don't know if he warned you guys, about, uh, the curse of being able to predict movies because we're studying the craft and with that quote unquote curse uh, I love unpredictability that much more but to actually get into the topic we're led to believe Ladybug is the lead which you know he's presented as that uh, but I found myself rooting for the twins almost immediately which you guys I think have stated or at least their dynamic was the best yeah their Tarantino-esque dialogue about fruits and Thomas I found to be endearing and funny and I'm also not currently, but I used to be a crazy Thomas and Trains person, like you can ask my parents. Uh, I would, I had like two Thomas tapes and would sit them down almost daily and we'd rewatch the same tapes all the time. Like, it was bad. Plus, Bar Brian Tyree Henry is one of my favorite actors, so there's that. I feel like you can honestly root for any of the assassins. I've never heard of anyone rooting for Dora the Explorer, but I could see an argument for it. Is that the prince? Yeah. Is that your yeah. name for... Okay. She had the the haircut, the pink outfit, the backpack. She looked like Dora the Explorer. Except not... I don't think she's Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Is she? Pretty sure she isn't. Yeah. Joey King is the actress. American actress. Oh, right. I forgot. She was Ramona. I never saw that movie. I did. Because I had sisters. Have. They aren't dead. Um, <laughs> but they used to be into that stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they went and saw that when I saw um, a movie that I'm not going to name because it is dead to us on this podcast. There's a lot of those. Which one? Uh, one where a, a bald-headed child... Okay, you're, you can stop there. Elements. You can stop there. <laughs> I was 100% sure Kamora was going to die. If y'all remember, she's, he's the one whose son got pushed. And then the elder, uh, Hiroyuki Sonata, 
He was a uh, scorpion in the Mortal Kombat movie. And he was also in John Wick 4, which we will have a separate thing for. Showed up, I thought, okay, he'll probably give his life to save his son and tell his son Kamora to continue pre protecting uh, Wataru or something. Uh, surprisingly and pleasantly, they both lived by the end and they just walked away. There were also a couple of fake out deaths, which also added to unpredictability, but none of them felt like they were cheating because there were hints earlier to show that this person could have and should have survived. Like, uh, I think Lemon getting the bulletproof vest. Um, that was the biggest example I could think of. You might forget that he had it on, or he had it with him, and then the prince shooting him. Uh, I think everything was really well planned out, or, or if it wasn't, you can blame fate or something. Cameos added to unpredictability uh, just a little bit, I think. I mean, technically, who could predict if they were... Who was in the movie if you didn't look them up which again i i didn't i just went in blind and the log line states there are five assassins that board the train but there are several by the time the movie ends and then technically none because the train goes off the rails and blows up or whatever just to mention a couple you had channing tatum as the train passenger as ozzy beats as the hornet michael shannon as white death sandra bullock as maria the handler and of course ryan reynolds as carver Last thing, I'm a little sad uh, Karen Fukuhara, who played the concession girl, didn't get a bigger role. Uh, we know she can kick ass as Kimiko and the boys. And I'm not sure what she does in the Callisto Protocol, but I'm pretty sure she probably kicks ass in that game too. And I, there was a point where I originally thought she was going to be the Hornet, because she was constantly in the background showing up, and she had the scene with uh, Tangerine and Ladybug, and then Ladybug do the sparkling bottle at him but yeah i i like the movie's unpredictability david you want to go in first what specifically what's the topic again because i i was listening to all of that and i took it all in but i forgot what was the topic ensemble so unpredictability yeah, ensemble, ensemble adding to unpredictability yeah oh well that definitely was like the charm for me of this film like i the plot and like all the stories like i can't really follow it and it, even then when i was watching it i was like you know there's a lot they're trying to tell me to follow and there's too many famous people and it's happening too fast so i'm just going to enjoy what my eyes are like seeing because it was a visual feast and that was like a lot of the fun for me like bad bunny i had no idea he was in this movie so yep. when the door opened and he was just staring at him and that whole exchange was a lot of fun for a ladybug's character and like killing him but not killing him and all of that and then just like every i think michael shannon got the biggest laugh out of me like by the time he came in and he had like the full lace front and it's like the gold and the gray just wispy wolf and he's just like the, the wind's blowing on him and he's looking up and i'm like wow he the, of course michael shannon's the white death and then of course the prince is related like there were this every everything they couldn't just have a cameo like there was all these tie-ins where it just felt like like the summer movie that I would have wanted to sit in on and been like, wow, that was something. Like, <laughs> they really just fed me for two hours, like, nonstop. Like, you thought it was going to end, no, more, 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 more. And I liked it. I don't think if they played this movie and, like, the exact same movie, production, script, edit, and the only thing that changed was the cast, and it was a bunch of no-name, like, up-and-coming actors that nobody knows, I don't think the movie plays no, the same way. Like, I think all of the charm of this movie is the ensemble and the star effect. Mm -hmm. I do like it when they're able to, like, hide some of the stars in the marketing and that's probably the benefit of having somebody as big as Brad Pitt mm. at the front of your thing. You can yeah. kind of just carry it by themselves. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a couple examples that I don't want to say just to not spoil those movies. But I do like that they're able to do it. Like It was fun seeing Channing Tatum was the one that hit <laughs> the best for me. <laughs> and I, I'd like heard that there were a bunch of cameos. I actually faked myself out. I thought that... Uh, the Sun was Ryan Gosling. It's not. It's Logan Thurman. But for a good 20 minutes, I was like, is it? Is that guy? Like, it looks kind of like him, but maybe he's too young. I, I loved the Channing Tatum one, though. God, he's got fun. a great look. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is this, is this a sex thing? <laughs> 
I like to think that he's not even a character that it's just like Channing Tatum was just re- like as himself was just on the train randomly. He's uncredited on IMDb. Oh, he was just taking a trip. Yeah. And he was just, he just happened to be in Japan. This is unpredictable in like I wasn't able to predict any of this. At the same time, I wasn't like trying to I wasn't trying to and I wasn't floored at any point and I, I think I'll a big part of the problem there is my lack of investment in any of the characters. Because, the, like, there wasn't an outcome I was hoping for. Like, there was none... I, I liked Lemon and Tangerine more, but I didn't, like, have any reason that I wanted them to get the case. It was kick-ass mm-hmm. and Paperboy, bro. What do you mean? No, I like both of them. Like, both characters and actors. But, like, in terms of backstory and like the goals that everyone had there was no person that i wanted to come out on top like i i kind of felt like it wanted us to want brad pitt to get it just because main character yeah but they didn't do any work to really set anyone up as like who to root for yeah and i'm not even saying they should have like said like, I, I really would have liked if they let us pick, but they had to give us something. There's two movies that came to mind. This is the first of several comparisons I'm going to make. Three Kings and Blood Diamond are two movies that have a MacGuffin at the center, but the characters have different motivations, and some of them are more relatable than others. Blood Diamond, I feel like, is kind of telegraphing to you, like, who it wants you to take the side of, but... Three Kings is one that I feel like is a little bit more uh, nebulous. I'm not going to say too much more to not spoil those movies. But the main difference between this and those two is that, like, you have something. Like, I have characters in those movies where I'm like, I do want this to work out for you. Or, actually, it's not really a MacGuffin, but, like, John Wick 4, which we just came out, like, there were, like three characters in that movie at a certain point where i was like i want all of these guys to get what they want and i don't know that they all will but i want it for all of them and i didn't have that at all in this so that was a detractor on my end i liked the reveal that they were all put on the train to kill each other like that was a cool revelation and then their decision to team up at the end was kind of like okay we're gonna throw off like the or we're gonna try to not do what they wanted us to and like not kill each other because that's just playing into their hands that was kind of cool at face value it didn't end up being as cool as i hoped on the whole i'd say this has like the skeleton of a good ensemble it has a good variety of characters making brad pitt such a main character does throw off the balance a bit so i i kind of wish we had done more of like i i hear what you guys are saying and that was a point i was not thinking of is like holding back some of the star power in the marketing but also just like keeping some of their faces away like especially michael shannon yeah that is cool in its own way i also kind of wish that they had been able to present these characters a little bit more evenly so that we have a little bit more of a like reservoir dogs kind of Mm -hmm. where like there's kind of four like you couldn't really name a main character for reservoir dogs even if like there's certainly some people who get more attention than others but i don't feel like any of them are especially favored both in terms of screen time or in terms of like who you're supposed to identify with it kind of lets you pick a little bit more action here we were just talking about brad pitt being the lead let's get into it david uh kick us off yeah so i don't watch a lot of action movies most of my action movies are kind of like the action i get comes through like superhero movies or like action adventure or like horror movies or sci-fi or something like that like i never really watch like just pure action movies and this has been like an interesting time the last few months because i've seen like the john wick movies i've seen this so i'm really kind of catching up on just like action and it's a fun genre and i've noticed at least in the old action movies that like i've went back and watched like the old 
uh, Bruce, what was his name? His dimension now. Yeah, Bruce Willis. The Bruce Willis movies and Arnold movies and even the um, Sylvester Stallone movies. There's always like this hyper masculinity that's kind of exercise through just like brutality and brute physical force and it was interesting to see just like i mean i don't think anyone would deny the masculinity of brad pitt but he's playing a very soft kind of just nice guy who would like the hat like i forget the type of hat they have but like a lot of fishers wear that hat when you like a bucket hat yeah like with the bucket hat and i was like Oh my god, not an assassin with a bucket hat. This is hysterical. <laughs> and I'm like, this looks like my uncle going to fish. And it's like the middle of the summer. And just the whole conversation he has with Sandra Bullock being like, I don't want to bring the gun, bring the gun. And just seeing that, it's so different because all the like old action movies that I saw, like it was like, wait till act one ended. And then like the action heroes, like close up, get me my gun. And then it's like, oh boy, it's about to go down. This movie's about to get crazy. But this one, he's like, I don't want the gun. I don't want any issues. I just want to be nice. And I just want to like, let everything be calm and be good. And he has a therapist, right? And I was like, what kind of action hero is this? Like, this is so different. And it was just, that was enough for me to lean in. But then I quickly, I don't know. I don't think it, like you guys are saying, I don't think there's really a main character or a POV to root for. I think they probably want you to see that in Brad Pitt, but like, I think quickly they abandon it and it becomes like the ensemble. So like, I'm never really rooting for him or like by the end, I wasn't really rooting for anyone, but I did find like that initial hook in the beginning to like have me lean in my chair. I was like, okay, an action movie where I know he's going to have to like get into a lot of fights with assassins and he doesn't want to fight anyone. And there's a lot of mistakes. This is enough of a premise for me to be like, I don't think I've seen this before. And I liked that. Mm -hmm. I hate this. I hate an action hero not wanting to kill. And I hate Batman for it. (laughs) I don't dislike Ladybug though, though I dislike him for killing Tangerine. So I do dislike him. It was supposed to be a simple snatch and grab job. He lets the audience know he shouldn't have gotten into any of this. So the whole accidental thing, I was fine with. Yeah. Ever you have some things to say as well before I get to my other points. I do. I like this idea on paper. I'm not sure that this movie pulls it off. Again, comparing to something else, Baby Driver, I think, is an example of a movie that does the like non-violent action hero a lot better. He's not completely averse to it. He does, like, everything he can to avoid violence. And I feel like in that movie, like, there's there's characters that I feel like in other things claim that, like, oh, violence is a last resort. And then they pull out their gun at a first sign of trouble. But I feel like Baby Driver does a really good job where it really does, like, push him to the limit where it's like he will not use violence unless he absolutely has to. But he's also more effective at avoiding violence because of his skills. And I kind of wish that we had had a little bit more of that with Ladybug. Like, he felt kind of too bumbling with it, where he was just kind of like, oh, 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 they died by accident. And if he was more skilled than, like, him not... He would have been better at not killing people. And that on its own would not necessarily fix it like i think having him be bumbling would have been fine if his identity as a character were different like if he wasn't voluntarily in this crime world it's i wasn't sure is he an assassin or is he just like a criminal for hire because it doesn't seem like he's an assassin for his main job the log line says five assassins so yeah i think he's an assassin but he's assassin. like a notoriously like bad one and like a bunch of like mishaps happen on whenever he's on the job so like now he's just trying to avoid killing that's why like when stuff like when there is like the accident and it kind of gets to that farce place i was like i kind of like it yeah plus he has skills that like normal hot criminal for hire shouldn't have like when he beat the hornet Uh, yeah stabbing her and then stealing her antidote like that no normal guy would be able to do that yeah like he clearly has some kind of combat training so it's not like he's unskilled but 
that combined with just kind of the way he just stumbles through everything and like everyone around him dies by accident like that maybe this is just me that didn't work great for me like if he was a complete outsider who got caught up in this by accident like again two more examples of something that do this game night and lucky number 11 i feel like oh, are yeah, two game good night. examples yeah we're like jason bateman and, so you want uh, him to be played by jason bateman no but like just he, say he's that playing is like he's doing kind of the same sh- sort of shtick that jason bateman does in that movie and, like along with the other characters but like they aren't expecting to be in an action movie whereas he knows like he knows he's in an action movie in this and then he's like oh geez oh oh they died oh man well that sucks if he didn't start his day knowing he was in an action movie that would hit like it'd at least be more relatable but he he knows that grab job evan just okay job, bro. but yeah like uh, maybe maybe this is just me like the maybe this is less of a problem with the movie and more just like my thing i didn't find that it worked as well and granted like i think we have enough action movies where like the hero is unwittingly there so it's not like we need more of that but there is kind of a point where that makes sense where like if you have some random guy off the street who's fumbling around using a gun it's like yeah okay he's never held one before or never held like a real one but ladybug has so and like granted they don't have him like not know how to use a gun or anything like that but every death around him is accidental and it just i don't know it didn't work for me do you guys feel like it would be better or worse if he was kind of like that sort of outsider character that I'm describing where he, he woke up today, not thinking he was going to be in an action movie Would that improve it or make it worse. Probably better. They'd have to find a way to connect him to Carver though. Cause remember it was supposed to be Carver. So maybe the white death thought it was, he just looks so much like this assassin or something. But I feel like that's been done before. Yeah, I mean, that was basically Lucky Number 11. I think it's a name instead of a face there, but it's just like a mistaken identity thing. We gotta talk about that movie someday. I'm not saying Ryan Reynolds would have been better, because it probably would have felt more like Deadpool or the Hitman's bodyguard. Yeah, Carver assassinated the White Death's wife when it was supposed to be the White Death in the car, so I like to think it could have been more interesting if somebody competent was there, or if they went the opposite way, like you're saying, Evan with the uh, guy who's not supposed to be there. Maybe he gets the briefcases mixed up or something, and he's like, I thought this was my briefcase. Or you guys have the wrong briefcase. He has a briefcase that looks exactly like the one with the tank engine sticker. Well, that would be calling back to another quite famous Brad Pitt role. Because that's how he's introduced in Fight Club, is having the same briefcase as Ed Norton. I also think that could work. Maybe it's the same bucket hat. They're like, oh god, it's the guy with the bucket hat. And then... <laughs> and that's Home Alone 2, basically. And then it's Adam they Sandler. They see the bucket hat? Okay. And they're like, whoa, that's crazy. I don't think any of these are necessarily the wrong choice just because they've been done before. And again, it, it's not a choice that the movie actually makes. It's just like one where I feel like his personality would be a little bit more justified. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. It would make a little more sense. Yeah. Or if, and again, this is another major cliche, but if this is supposed to be his last job where he gets out, <laughs> then that <laughs> might be another thing. I know I'm saying all of this is like criticism, but I do think that all of these pitches that I'm having would make it feel more derivative. I don't personally think it feels super fresh, but... It might have just felt like, oh, God, another one of these Mm -hmm. if we did one of these things that I'm pitching. David, do you think it would be better or worse if he was an outsider? There's two ways for me that, like, I think I would enhance Brad Pitt's character. I think the one way is what you're saying. It's like, I would think if they marketed this movie 
as Brad Pitt as the lead and they showed in the trailer like him outside the train and then it was all like a misdirect and he's outside the train and then like someone who's wearing the exact same outfit as him walks on the train and he doesn't actually get on and then we're following that guy and like he accidentally or like for whatever reason like they could like switch coats or some stupid farce thing and then like he has like the briefcase information and then we're following some average joe that i would like to that's like funny enough for me to get into it or they could just i would be completely fine if like they leaned into ladybug being like more self-aware with what's happening like let ladybug fully kill someone and then just be like self-aware of like why is the why do why do i have to keep killing people like oh my god like this is the third person today oh my and like i would be fine with that kind of attitude too but either one of those personalities i would have bought more because i don't like ladybug's personality you know what would have been really cool that i'm just thinking of if they killed ladybird in the first like two or ladybug sorry wrong movie <laughs> um if they killed ladybug in the first like 20 minutes that would be wow. so cool i think I, I don't know what reason but like that would just be such a fun misdirect to have brad pitt be your poster boy and then oh god he's dead and now it gets to that would just i don't know i i think that would be cool what is wrong with you why it's not wanna... that I want to see Brad Pitt die. I think it'd just be cool to be Brad like Pitt? main character, like person that we think is going to be leading the movie for like both if you have or haven't seen the marketing. And it's like, nope, this isn't his movie. I just think that'd be kind of This is cool. the Lemon and Tangerine show. Yeah, that <laughs> that sounds a little better to me. Granted, you have to come up with a like actual story around that which would just make this a completely different movie but i feel like that could have been somewhat on brand for the kind of like twists that this was trying to throw in and that just would have been the ultimate pull out the rug well that got a little off the rails oh ayo <laughs> but let's get back on track with the <laughs> <laughs> with the uh the next topic we don't have anything else for that evan's topic does this half-ass a theme is a theme well go on okay so let's just i'll just ask the question broadly then do we think this half-ass is its theme well no i i kind of say ultimately not really i, I think it, it does C. i i you think, think it, it does it's b at least okay yeah, I'm going to, like, run through the checklist I made for the Kingsman video, but I definitely don't want to limit the conversation to that. Just, we can kind of use it as a springboard. Because that was just kind of what I thought of when I got to the end of this. I was like, I guess this does half-ass a theme. I don't know, that this was me thinking when I finished the movie, I was like, I don't know if this did it well or not. And then I've kind of been thinking about that the past week, getting ready for this. Thematic concept, in this case, I would say is fate or luck. Like, kind of the combination of those two, because... They talk about it quite a bit. First question to throw at it, is this a simple concept that can be engaged with in a way that isn't polarizing? Not polarizing, I think it succeeds at that. I don't think it's simple enough. So, tick down there. Is the protagonist designed to directly engage with the thematic concept? I would say mostly yes. He's not really supposed to be on the train, and he's not really supposed to be caught up in the villain's master plan so that sets him up immediately to be like this whole situation feels like bad luck and we kind of establish that he has a history with that so check there do the minor characters and plot tie directly to the theme characters a little bit plot more so i would say there's several events that you can look at and like say that could be construed as good or bad luck, depending on how you look at it. So that's a, like, there's a bit of thematic conversation going on there. There's also things, I'm not quite sure how this ties into the thing, but there's a few events that to one character look like they're just luck, but they're actually the result of some other character's actions. So I'm not quite sure where that fits, but I feel like it has a place in this conversation. And then, does the protagonist's relationship with the, with the thematic concept change? Hard yes. Does it have a strong, consistent thematic answer? I would say not really. And that is where I 
think this fails at half-assing its theme. Ladybug has a new outlook on his relationship with fate and luck by the end, but I don't feel like the text of the movie fully supports his outlook, especially because so many other characters have died by accident, and it's not like Ladybug's new outlook is why he survives and others don't. I think this has, like, a somewhat clear arc. I don't feel like this has a tight thematic answer. So that's where I'm going to say, like, it it doesn't full-on fail, but it does not succeed in my eyes. What do you guys think going beyond, like, either refuting the answers that I gave or going outside of the checklist? Oh, I'm going to refute. Okay, please do. Because I can see how, like, somebody else could really vibe with this, and I just didn't. All right. The entire theme of the movie is brought up so often. I'm sure every char- every main character mentions it at some point. And you, first of all, the main character's name is Ladybug. And they explain, he was saying uh, his handler was being ironic, but uh, here you see Sonata's character, the elder, was explaining that he bears the seven sorrows. There's this whole thing, rant. He goes on about the fate and luck and all of that. And I like to think that also um, caters towards his change or viewpoint of it by the end. And you can't tell me fate slash luck that got Ladybug on the train in the first place that, that it wasn't that because Carver got food poisoning. That's never explained so you could chalk that up to something. I thought he was just leaving him out to dry. I thought it was kind of revealed later that he made up the food poisoning thing and was just throwing Ladybug under the bus. I don't remember that ever being confirmed. I guess it's not confirmed. I thought it was strongly suggested. He just said Carver's a dick. Yeah, I guess maybe it's not, like, suggested as strongly as I read it. It's just, like, it would make sense. Mm. So the White Death hired the wrong guy. Lemon running over Prince with the tangerine truck because she got tangerine killed because she's a fucking diesel. You can't tell me that's not fate or luck either. Like, why out of all fruits? I've never even fucking seen a tangerine truck. But that's what he, that's the first car he comes upon when he gets out of the, the river that he should have died from, but luck. From from the fall, I, I don't know, maybe a human can survive that. He also had a vest on, but. The Elder being a guard for Minigishi, then fighting the White Death again at the end because the White Death's daughter pushed his grandson off a roof because of individual character things like you were saying individual character actions and stuff all of that melded together to the climax at the end ladybug being at the wedding where i forgot what he was doing there exactly but being at the wedding where wolf's bad bunny uh his peoples die because of the hornet so he thinks the hornet did it which is what got the wolf killed in his heart in corazon the snake biting ladybug like the snake had been had escaped like midpoint through the movie but the start of act three he's the one that finally gets bit but it's luck that has it that he had uh already put the anti-venom on when he fought the hornet or in a system not on maybe also you considered evan that maybe it's not it's just ladybug's opinion on the theme that matters lemon fighting off finding the tangerine truck Think changes his opinion because of the irony and i don't think it's lost on the audience because again his partner's name was oh what was it tangerine the team up at the end even though each of them had a reason to kill the others either because of actions or whatever the white deaths plan to put them all on a train but then that working against them because the elder was there because he's the one that talked them out of killing each other at a different point in time they almost killed each other or did kill a loved one someone close to them no i don't think it half asses a theme at all that's what i meant to say so you think it whole asses it no what no (laughs) i think it it does it well i think it focuses on it for more than half of the goddamn movie i'll agree with you that like and this is where i think it succeeds the most is like all these things you're listing i think it is presenting like is this luck? Is it not? Is, like, is it just... Especially the moment that I feel like it's there the strongest is the snake bite, where he's already... Because the snake didn't make that decision? 
No, because he already got the venom. So, like, you could say really bad luck that he got bit by a snake. But wow, isn't it great that he already got the antidote earlier that night? Bad luck with the water bottle, too. Lemon drinking the water bottle and fainting when he could have killed the prince. Yeah, like, I, I, I really wanted to hear you push back against this. And I think you have quite a bit because I wasn't looking for this the first time. And I know you may not have been looking for it the second time. But I only had the one viewing to look at this. So maybe it would hit different. I don't know that I would like the movie more if I were able to be like, yes, this does its theme better than I'm saying it does. I agree with you that it is present in a lot of places. Here's my question for you, though. What is its answer to, like, the role of fate or luck? Do you think the movie has a coherent answer? Because as far as I can see, it does not. It's at least not consistent. But maybe I missed something because I only saw it the one time. Does it have to have an answer? Or should the character speak on that? Well, or is the character maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm looking it. at it the wrong way. Like, Which is why I'm saying like, if somebody else vibes with this, I don't want to take that away from you. Like, Just because it doesn't fit my checklist doesn't necessarily mean it does a bad job. This is how I read the ending. I feel like it's saying it's trying to like be on Ladybug's side with like, yeah, like just go with the flow kind of and let life do its thing and just kind of roll with it. But then I think within seconds of him saying that, like, I think it's like a lamppost falls on Sandra Bullock's car. Yeah. So it's I feel like the text of the movie is refuting him there no he was saying and then he immediately says fate didn't want us to get in the car so you think the movie's answer is like go with the exactly what ladybug's outlook is at the end yeah okay maybe i just disagree with that and like with that outlook and maybe that's why evan doesn't go with the flow i I don't hate it as a thematic answer it's just here's here's what it made me think of like this whole thing it made me think of the end of The Miserable Mill, the series of unfortunate events book, the fourth one. That kind of ends with the three kids sitting together and thinking back on the events of the book and just kind of going, yeah, the situation we're in is terrible, but it was good luck that these different things happened throughout it. Like, It could have been worse. It is lucky that we made it out. I feel like it's like another way. Maybe that's just one that works for me personally better in dealing with a theme like this. Or Children of Men is something that I think kind of deals with the same theme as well. So, you know what? I'm going to say you've convinced me, Jelani. Like, this does a better job than I'm giving it credit for. It's just... Oh, shit. It's not my thing, I think. It doesn't work for me. I won. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work. I win. All right, there are going to be no more episodes from this point on. <laughs> the end of interior been, analysis. You're going to quit I've while been, you're ahead. Yep. I've It'll been be just me and David. Win against Evan for the past three years. It's just going to be, I won. I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I'm one and oh. No, no, I've lost a lot more arguments. Uh, I never yeah. realized it was a competition. No, it was never a competition. I'm just. <laughs> Until I'm, right now. I'm one and oh. Uh, I would starting have, right now, I wouldn't I'm have admitted d- d- defeat if you if you were gonna leave. <laughs> <laughs> David, you were on Evan's side though, yeah. so oh, no. I still I don't I have any more I points. Was not one over. Uh, Fuck, I'm one and one. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, a lot of the reasons why the theme felt half-assed and didn't work for me was it's a lot of telly and not show like a lot of the ways this theme has to work contextually is by characters speaking to each other and explaining things that have happened in the past and giving exposition so then when the scenes happen later you're like oh but it doesn't work that well for me i'm much more of a show type of person i'll get bored quite easily and just kind of like zone out and then it also didn't work because I don't think the movie really picks a side between luck or fate or defines them well enough. And I think, like, even the elder is, like, by the end, he's like, you know what, Ladybug, does it matter? Does it matter which one it is? Because you're here. And you just gotta keep going. 
and I'm like, okay, but like also, so is luck fate? Are they the same thing? Are they different? I don't know. And like, it doesn't need to be like deep and profound. Cause to me, this is like literally like an August popcorn action movie with like a killer cast. But like, yeah, I don't think like it was the most well done thematic moment ever, especially when it comes to like action movies. That's what I'm saying with, I think it's, it's a little bit too complex of a theme for something like this to deal with. Cause it's, cause theme is not its top priority. And that's kind of like the prerequisite I set out for when something half asses a theme. Like if theme is low enough on the priority list, then you got to pick something simple. And despite what I said, I do think this is too complex. And like I said, I am not won over by like, I, I don't I feel like this is really messy. I am gonna push back a little bit, David, on the show part because I agree with you that there is a lot of tell. There's a lot of talking about theme in this. Probably a lot more than there is showing. But there are moments where I think it's present and not remarked upon. A lot of the or I don't know about a lot, but a few of those moments that Jelani was listing a few minutes ago, I was not thinking of those at least a few of them as places where the theme was really in the conversation. And there, there might be others that we haven't pointed to yet that it's there. So I think, is it telling more than showing almost definitely, but there is showing there. Like there is stuff that's not just like talking about fate or luck. It's like the, the events of the story are in conversation with this. No, no, I agree. With the Elder and the White Death specifically, like, <clears throat> him, his whole Ladybug just being there is what allows that whole dynamic and kind of storyline or thread to, like, play out. And, like, that to me, like, is a time they show you, okay, this is fate paying off or luck, whichever it is that brought him to this moment that's allowing for them to shoot off the booby-trapped gun and everything. But I only feel or know about this because they had to talk about it instead of, and that's just because it's a movie on a train <laughs> and they have to, they're not, they're not taking place anywhere else than the train where like, for me, I would have rather just seen, I don't know, like the actual stories come together and then maybe the train be like, maybe this be in a nonlinear way type of thing and then have that pay off just so it's not, I'm only feeling the theme here because I had to be told all of this stuff in the first act that kind of allows for this to pay off. That to me felt a little cheap. What if it was called Lucky Train? Lucky Train. And, and the train was alive and had a face. That's crazy. I was thinking the same thing about the face. Not alive though. But why don't they make trains and, with faces? And. I don't, I'm and glad trains don't have faces. Is it because they scare people? Bunch, had a bunch of friends, and they were different colors. Mm, I, I wouldn't like that you movie. Know, one of them was a shit stir called Diesel. Oh. David, are you just now picking up what he's been doing? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just have to sell the boat. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say, like... Even I caught on a couple minutes ago, and I'm usually pretty slow with those kinds of things. Uh, this is the greatest movie ever. Mm. And going even one and one isn't bad. I'm going to gracefully bow out. What what will this show be without me? Uh, well, we're going to have to f figure out ways to do superhero movies, because I mm. basically just leave that to you. <laughs> mm. Despite yeah, having are a couple you gonna leave before across the Spider Verse? Like that's crazy. Oh fuck. Okay. Yeah. Uh, back <laughs> I'm back. I'm back, y'all. Uh... Is this gonna become the new bit that we have to like keep you <laughs> on the show? Well, I guess I'll stick around <laughs> until this one. <laughs> it's almost like I never left. There's always gonna be more superhero movies coming out, so I'm never gonna leave. Cause that's true. Are they all gonna be good though? Oh no. You've been getting not. some bad ones. Uh, I'm out of notes. Yeah, I'm so. out. This, uh, this is, I like this. Okay. This is a good episode still. I like no, the debate yeah. and back and forth. Now, I, I, I don't really fight hard for things. Because I, I just assume Evan's 
he, he's done this more than I have, so I just assume that is right most of the time. Not well, you shouldn't. Fight. <laughs> <laughs> Fight, fighting for it, it, uh, I think that made this nice and spicy. No, I'm, I'm also glad that we, because I feel like it is usually the other way where I'm trying to convince you to like something. Oh, and yeah. I'm, I'm glad that it was reversed. And that, I mean, you didn't, uh, you're not going to make my rating of this go up. You're not making me want to rewatch it. But oh, like, no, that's fine. I was going into this hoping that you could show me some things that I missed about where this is good. And that did happen. Great. So I'm, I'm glad that that happened. Yes. I still want you to like Scott Pilgrim, but you you are not the only person I've met that it, I, I just got one of my sisters to watch it, and she was like, yeah, it didn't work for me. I was like, well, Oof. That, that's too bad. <laughs> Did you disown her? No. Oh. No, I, I get it. Like, there's distancing things in, in Scott Pilgrim. But that's it. We got one yep. other thing to record, so we're going to jump into that. But, um, solid episode, y'all. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching Bullet Train. And make sure you go check it out streaming on uh, Netflix. Yeah, probably should have done that before listening to this. But yeah. if for whatever reason you didn't, uh, then. Yeah. If you like action comedy and trains. Train. I'm going to run through the boilerplate real quick. Our next episode uh, is going to be Silence of the Lambs. And is that streaming anywhere? Uh, Ooh, let's see. I haven't checked. I think it might be on HBO. Anyway, that'll be our next one. We have our Patreon for $1 a month. And it is. I'm going to do a longer plug than usual for the Patreon because it is a really good time to join. Because we, we got our tangent episode up there recently with all our tangents from the past year. The John Wick trilogy we have up there. And we're about to, right after we're done with this, we're going to record our quick hot takes on the fourth one that just came out and uh from way back we have our episode this was when it was well okay i'll do the other one that has david in it which is our early writing experiences and then from way back we got me and jelani ranting for three long episodes about the <laughs> Raimi spider-man trilogy we did three episodes we we, we watched did... all three movies on that Yes. Oh God. Yes. I don't... I, okay. I thought. I think I thought when we were first planning that we were gonna do all three in one, and then yeah. you were like, "All right, so just Spider-Man one tonight." I was like, "Oh, oh, oh, we're doing one at a time." Okay. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I put that out of my head. Oh, those damn. got pretty unhinged. <laughs> um, <laughs> the hinges come off quite quick in that one, but there. If if you like, if you like hearing us hate on those the way we normally do you get a whole lot of that in those episodes and then we have our uh episode on the two kingsman movies that's just the one episode that that one's not like the, the raimi ones are really the only negative ones i think everything else on there is generally like at least it's not negative and i think generally they're positive actually i lied because the other oh. thing we that i just got up there yeah. is the watch alongs i didn't know you got those similarly up. fun yeah, I finally got through the technical difficulties. So nice. we have one on Chicken Little. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to recommend, like, feel free to watch our uh, watch-along of it. You probably shouldn't watch Chicken Little. If you haven't, you're not missing anything. If you have seen it and were like, huh, I should retry that. No, you shouldn't. It's... We did it so that you don't have to. Oh, my God. But the watch-along is pretty fun. If you are going to watch Chicken Little, then do it with our commentary. Yeah. But also don't rewatch Chicken Little because <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, which is why we picked it for the trial run. What he's trying to say is, give us a dollar. Yes, and we'll make it worth. We'll make it worth it. I promise. But don't don't torture yourself with rewatching Chicken Little or watching it for the first time. But I would recommend. Our other watch along is Mission Impossible 2. Mm. And that one I do recommend you <laughs> watch the movie along with it. There was some because, shit in that, bro. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not necessarily great. Um, I'd say it's pretty... <laughs> it's, it's pretty universally agreed to be the worst Mission Impossible movie. But there's some really fun stuff in there. But yeah. All up there. Only $1 a month. A lot of good stuff with more to come. And... 
You can also check out our YouTube channel with our new John Wick video. And you can still leave your picks for the 2022 awards in the comments of that YouTube video. You could do it in others, but that would just be confusing. So just do it in the right one. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcast. Our logo is by Kelsey Hendry. I'm on Letterboxd at Ev underscore Wes. And where are both of you? Uh, Instagram, Jelani T. Kelly. YouTube, same place. Don't follow me on Twitter. I'm deleting that soon, I think. <laughs> I'm with Diesel. Because the Diesels of the world get a bad no. rep. There's a sick no. stigma in the train community about the Diesels oh of the God. world. <laughs> and I'm here to dismiss that stigma. So all the Diesels out there, come to me. Oh, no. I was going to say, don't be a Diesel, man. That's what I was going to end with. But... Oh, God. What you just well, said makes me feel icky. For this has reason. been an episode with a lot of disagreements, so I think you can be either. Just know that uh, either David or Jelani will be your enemy. And if you so, found this episode, it was fate slash luck that got you here. <laughs> for sure. But we hope you stick around. <laughs> <laughs>